The price has gone from, let's say in 2020, it was as low as 6,000 to almost approaching kind of 20,000 a ton. The price has exploded. Talking tin today and antimony with Anthony and the Oregon group. Great to have you here. And yeah, we've never talked about uh, these two uh, metals or commodities before. So um, maybe you would like to give a brief introduction of what is antimony and tin all about? These are kind of two of the hot metals that you've never heard of and, and probably didn't know anything about until recently. Oftentimes as investors, as speculators, as just people interested in commodities, we focus on silver and gold and copper, all of which are important, but they get so much airtime that we kind of forget about some of these minor metals. You know, let's take antimony. So people don't realize antimony is critical to semiconductors and solar panels actually. So, you know, when you look at antimony in, in 2000, let's say 90% of the antimony market was about fire retardant. It was used just in suits and what have you to prevent fires. But as the, the market has developed, uh, it's become a critical component of solar, which as we know with tin, we're going to talk about it in a minute. Solar is, is this critical driver now with exploding um, demand globally. And then it's used as a hardener inside of bullets and it's used in the semiconductor making process. So what about supply? Where are the major suppliers? What jurisdiction? What kind of players uh, are we looking at in the antimony market? You know, historically, China, to put this in perspective, kind of created 100,000 tons a year. They're doing 40,000 tons a year. What you have had is in terms of production, it's China is the largest producer, then Tajikistan, and then Russia. Last time I checked, you know, none of those producers are on the best of terms with the West. In fact, if you um, look at the recent headlines, China is, is limiting antimony exports. There is not a single antimony mine in the U.S. There was one, I believe, in Montana that closed down in the last 24 months. What about early exploration projects? What about the pipeline to bring um, antimony production in safe jurisdiction? ASX and TSX being what they are, you know, they, they uh, are market animals responding, of course, to this imbalance and price explosion that's happened. I think that you are going to see exploration projects and projects with antimony credits start to come to market like soon. And in fact, in Australia, you know, some have come to market. But I, I think the trouble with antimony is, you know, by and large, it doesn't drive the economics of a project. You know, for instance, in China, uh, a lot of the antimony is a byproduct of gold production. And so, you know, as gold has gone up, it's not really made financial sense or just sense to collect the antimony unless directed by the government. Kind of a different program. So, by the way, is there a, a price spot market for antimony? Do we have any insights on how the price developed over the last 24 months? The price has gone from, let's say in 2020, it was as low as 6,000 to almost approaching kind of 20,000 a ton. The price has exploded and it's because there's actual demand. So, you know, so you have you have a supply and demand scenario. You have solar demand just kind of exploding globally, right? And then of course you have the baseline fire retardant. You have semiconductor demand exploding. Like, like let's face it, every aspect of our lives is controlled now by computers and, and with AI and what's happening, you're seeing all the CPUs and build out, which also ultimately requires more semiconductors. What about your top three early exploration or byproduct companies that you would invest in if you wanted to play the antimony market? I'm looking at a handful of companies that are going to go public, but it's really hard to get exposure. And the ones that have lifted listed on the ASX to date, I haven't seen one where I'm like, wow, this actually could be really interesting. So I think though, if I uh, historically look at minor metals, projects will come out of the works. It, it always happens that people will go back and look into their closets and they will find antimony projects that make sense. I haven't seen those yet, but I, I guarantee you the market will respond. But if history is a guide, I mean, look at cobalt as, you know, the basic example, you know, all sorts of interesting projects came out of the works when you saw that spike in, in cobalt. So I'm confident that in the coming months or year, you will see projects the supply side the, the key response or the easiest response on the supply side would be for companies to add circuits to their current production. Notwithstanding that, you know, it only makes to add, even if price is extremely high, you still have to um, be 
able to produce enough for it to make sense. And so I don't think, you know, unlike some byproduct metals like a cobalt where, you know, it's a 10 to 1 ratio, nickel and cobalt are kind of 10 to 1 in, in nickel deposits and, and in the Congo it's higher with copper deposits. And so it's very easy to capture the cobalt. I think with antimony, we could be stuck at much higher prices for a prolonged period of time because I don't know that you're going to have that immediate supply response through like secondary circuits. And so that's why it's really interesting. So I have to say, I'm actually looking at the moment to try to see if there are going to emerge any, you know, I don't know if you call them primary antimony plays. I've not seen one, but maybe one where antimony is a material portion of the economics of the given project. Yeah, so if you have a primary antimony play just about to go public, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, what you said, it's a bit uh, similar to the rare earth market. Best regards here to you, Cor. Uh, you have rare earth everywhere. If you go in your back garden, you have rare earth in, in every uh, shovel, every bucket you take. But it's all about uh, finding um, quantities that are commercially viable and finding the, the chains that... Uh, the, the right rare earth that you need for certain applications. Now, moving over to tin, that's a market that's also not been that present. I mean, if I look back over the last two years on investor conferences, um, I've never heard uh, anybody talk about tin. So where are we with tin on the demand side? And what about supply right now? China controls ultimately both of these markets. You know, over half of the world's refining capacity for tin is in China. Uh, a lot of the production is in Indonesia and Myanmar. If you look at nickel production, we're at 80% globally out of Indonesia. Once again, the installed refining capacity is in China. I think on the demand side, once again, you have similar drivers to antimony, some differences. First one being solar. You have a, an explosion of solar and, and you have an explosion of semiconductors. And I, when I think about Tin, I think about it being kind of the glue that holds together the electric revolution, right? It's the solder inside of the batteries, inside of the motherboards in some cases. It's a really critical aspect of the energy transition. And what about tin prices over the last two years? Um, how have they developed? Tin has kind of gone up and down. Tin has been much, uh, a little bit of a different story. You know, they exploded higher, they fell off, and now it feels like they found a floor and are moving up again. One difference with tin is there is tin production in Africa. Our large uh, alpha men you know, is the big name. I like the name in terms of like the cash profile and, and every aspect of it, but it, it's like this. Everything is okay until it's not. And my worry for that that project has always been and will always be that it's going to be just fine until next Wednesday. And increasingly, I think the global supply chain is relying on that mine. It's large, high grade BCBC region of, you know, the Congo. It, it sort of has all those boxes ticked. I've been to that area. I've not been specifically to the mine, but uh, and it's just a rough part of the world. It's not what you would call a tier one safe jurisdiction. So what about early stage exploration projects in Canada or Australia? Do we have any coming up or what's the pipeline looking like? There's a group out of Europe, Simon Cat. I know he's the banker who's working on their project. And I think it's called First 10. You know, they have projects in Australia, Germany, I believe. You know, I, I don't know, like, is can you permit in, in Europe? I don't know the answer to those questions personally, and I, if, if that's possible. Um, you know, tin also is a very liquid contract. And so an investor can actually simply go buy a tin contract on, on an interactive broker account. And so, you know, there are ways to play tin. But I, I feel that tin and antimony are really uniquely positioned. They're minor metals. It's not easy to ramp up global production. Okay. Yeah. Anthony, thank you very much for sharing these insights. Fair to say that we have a definitely a challenge along the mega trend of deglobalization and safe jurisdiction being the key currency here. And we'll see how this plays out, how North America, Europe are going to step up in this game. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and, and drop me a line anytime.